Good morning to everyone and welcome to our Sunday service from Carrick Fergus Methodist Church. I don't know what this week has been like for you, uh, for some of you. Uh, it will have been uh, quite nice, really, um, not having to go to work, um, shut in at home, uh, enjoying your own company and uh, hopefully the company of anybody else who lives in your house and the sunshine and maybe a walk with a dog. Uh, whatever the week has been, some of you for for some of you perhaps it's been a difficult week, and you've had some bad news, and you're getting fed up, feeling shut in. Perhaps you're worried about your finances, and there might be all kinds of other stresses and strains upon you. And so it's good to draw aside for uh, an hour or so on a Sunday morning or whatever time you're watching this, and. Uh, listen to God's word and to allow him to um, speak into your heart and soul, uh, to nourish you, to encourage you, uh, to give you his peace. And to remember his promises, uh, we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us, says Peter. And so uh, we begin with a short prayer and ask for God's uh, leading and guiding and invite his Holy Spirit to come and speak to us. Our gracious, loving God, we thank you for our fellowship together. And even though we're not met together, we thank you that uh, in the power of your Holy Spirit, we are part of your one body uh, in heaven and on earth. We thank you, Lord, that uh, your grace unites us all through faith in Jesus Christ. And wherever we may be, um, sitting in front of our televisions or our laptops or our smartphone, uh, joining in with this service, may we know that you are in our midst and that you're here by your spirit uh, to speak words of grace to each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this week past. We thank you, Lord, that we've had um, food to eat. Uh, we've had homes to live in. We've had uh, friends to share our lives with. Perhaps we have not physically been able to uh, shake their hands or hug them or eat out with them. Uh, but through um, various uh, means, um, uh, chatting over the garden fence uh, at a distance of six feet uh, or talking on the phone or um, through the Internet or other um, electronic means, we have been able to share together. We thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that we've had, those of us who've been part of the church WhatsApp group, um, listening to various or sharing, reading various uh, thoughts for the day, uh, being reminded of uh, people that we should pray for and being encouraged as we hear some news of answers to prayers. We thank you, Lord, for all those encouragements uh, in this week past. And Father, we give to you all the frustrations, the cares and concerns that may weigh us down. We thank you, Lord, that as we share those burdens with you in prayer, individually and together, we can know uh, your presence with us and hear your answers. And so, Lord, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to meet in this way and to share around your word. And let's share the Lord's prayers begin as we begin. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> and I'm going to start uh, this service with our little children's story. Um, I'm going to do it myself today and maybe next week I'll get Nikki. Uh, and I've, I've been working on Josh to try and persuade him to read one of the stories for you boys and girls. So uh, we'll see. Maybe um, uh, I can persuade him to do that. Um, but this story I'm going to tell you is one I've told you before and some of you, maybe some of the boys and girls won't remember it because uh, it's a few years back. Um, 
uh, but maybe your mum or dad or your granny or granda will uh, remember it because it's quite a striking story. And I heard it years ago and it really helped me to explain or to understand <clears throat> a very difficult couple of verses in the Bible. And you'll find them in various places. And uh, the reason I'm telling the story today, this story today is that uh, it, it fits in with uh, one of the main lessons uh, in our sermon a little bit later on. Uh, the difficult verses, uh, you find them in Isaiah, in Isaiah, but particularly in Jeremiah. And three times in the book of Jeremiah, early on in the book, uh, God says to Jeremiah, his prophet, <clears throat> to not pray for this people. Uh, Jeremiah has been sent to uh, bring God's word to the people. And yet God says uh, to Jeremiah, these three points, uh, do not pray anymore for these people. Now, why on earth do you think God would tell his prophet not to pray for the people? Well, here's a story that helps to understand that, at least in, 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 to some extent. <clears throat> it's a true story. Um, when I first heard it, I um, misunderstood the first bit of it um, about an Indian. And I thought it was a Native American Indian the story was about. Um, but then um, a number of years later, I actually saw this myself, um, well, on TV. <clears throat> and it's about an Indian in India. Um, and uh, the story was that a missionary went to India a long time ago. And uh, he met this holy man who had made a promise to God, to his God, uh, the Hindus believe in lots of different gods, but whichever his particular god was, he had made a promise that he would keep a vow um, for 10 years. And as I say, I was watching this TV program about the big festival that they have uh, at the Ganges every year. And people come from all over India to, to, to wash in the Ganges and so on. Uh, so uh, this Indian had made this promise to his god to do this thing for um, 10 years. You might wonder what it was. Well, it was simple enough at one level. He had promised to keep his arm up in the air like this <clears throat> for 10 years. So all day, all night, all the time, uh, he would keep his arm in the air. Now, I don't know whether it was his right one or maybe it was his, his left one. Um, if you're right-handed, it might be easier to keep your left hand up because everything else you'd have to do, uh, brush your teeth and um, all sorts of anything else you need to do, uh, it would be awkward. Anyway, the story was that um, the missionary had just arrived, saw this man, uh, asked some of his friends and some of the other people who could speak a bit of English what was going on. And they explained that he'd made his promise to keep his arm in the air for 10 years. And that was the first year. Each year, uh, this holy man and all, all Lots and lots of people came uh, to the to the river and the missionary uh, also went. And year after year, he saw this man there <clears throat> with his arm up in the air like this. And seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years, <clears throat> there was this man with his arm up like this uh, in, in the air, keeping his vow. Well, the next year, which was year 11, and the missionary knew that it was year 11 because he could remember the year that he came, he saw this same holy man coming, walking down towards the Ganges. Now, by this time, of course, the missionary could speak the local languages, and so he was able to, to talk to the man without anyone trying to translate into English for him. And lo and behold, there he was in year 11, and he still had his arm up in the air like this and so the missionary said to him oh i see you back again how are you and they chatted for a while and, and, and then uh, the mission said, I, I hope you don't mind me asking you a, a personal um question um but why, why have you still got your arm up in the air because this is definitely year 11 and i remember you telling me that you made this vow to keep your arm like that for for 10 years so what's going on? Uh, have you made another vow to keep it up for another um, another 10 years or what? And then the old uh, 
Indian holy man kind of smiled a little bit and uh, he said, well, no, I haven't made another vow, um, but you see, my arm is stuck. You see, boys and girls, he'd had his arm like that all day, all night for uh, uh, those 10 years. And so uh, all the tendons around his uh, shoulder and possibly even the, the, the bone in his shoulder had frozen solid. And now uh, his arm had been up like that for so long, it was stuck. And he couldn't get it down. He could maybe move it a little bit, but he couldn't get it back down the way that it would normally be like the other one was. And you see, that helped me to understand those difficult verses in the book of Jeremiah. The people in Jeremiah's day had been disobeying God for year after year after year. And God had sent various messengers. There were other prophets besides Jeremiah who had told the people to stop worshipping these foreign gods and idols and, and doing all these uh, things that they, they shouldn't have been doing, uh, disobeying God. But they kept on doing them and they had refused to listen to God's messengers. And so now they were stuck. And God said to Jeremiah, there's no point in praying anymore for these people, because even if you pray for them, they're never going to change their minds. They are stuck. And boys and girls and mums and dads and grannies and grandas as well, that's a very serious and somber lesson for all of us to remember. We too can get stuck. Now we know what it's like sometimes you get a you get a bad habit. I don't know whether any of you grannies and grandas still smoke. And maybe you started smoking when you were the age of the boys and girls. Uh, maybe you were only 10 or 11 or 12 when you started and uh, it became an addiction. And it can be very, very hard to break that. And you know, uh, it's a little bit like that. When we, when we uh, reject God's word, uh, we've been taught in Sunday school and we said, no, I don't believe that. Maybe we went to church for a while and said, no, I don't believe what the minister says. Uh, and maybe we've read a bit of the Bible and think, ah, it's a little nonsense, it's full of contradictions. And we stop uh, reading it, we stop thinking about it, and we just live our own lives and do our own thing. Now, it might not all be bad things, of course, it's just living our lives without God. And there comes a point sometimes when, having lived like that for so long, we are stuck. And it's very, very hard, even for God, to break through the shell that we've built around ourselves and to trust in him. Now we're going to have our Bible reading and uh, Hannah is going to read that for us. And then um, after that, uh, Nikki is going to say our prayers as we pray for, for others. And then I'll be back after that with our sermon. Our reading today is taken from John chapter 12, starting at verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me, and whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. 
the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Let us pray. Gracious God, whose spirit helps us in our weakness and guides us in our prayers, we pray for the church and for the world. Renew the life and faith of the church, strengthen our witness. May we be united in your truth and live together in your love. We praise you, Heavenly Father, creator of heaven and earth, that we can come to you with our prayers and petitions because of what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done to open the way to you through his death on the cross for our sins and his resurrection from the dead. Thank you that we come to an all-knowing God whose divine power far exceeds what we can even imagine. Lord, you are holy, we are sinful, yet we can approach you through your Son, who is even now sitting at your right hand interceding for us. We pray for our national and also our devolved governments at this time. We ask you to be with Boris Johnson. We ask you to restore him to full health. And may he have a renewed perspective, having been so ill with COVID-19. Give all the cabinet wisdom as they lead and plan in these unprecedented times of pandemic, that there may be a just and equal sharing of resources. We also ask for unity of purpose in our own devolved assembly to meet the needs of our lockdown communities in Northern Ireland. We pray for Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill as they lead we pray that you will give them wisdom and humility. We pray also, Lord, for our Methodist Church in Ireland. We pray for our president, the Reverend Sam McGuffin, and also for our lay leader, Linda Neelands, asking that you will give them wisdom and strength as they lead our church and as they come to the end of their time. We pray, Father, that you, there will be a good transition with the next people taking over their posts. We pray for safety for them, and we ask, Lord, that as they continue to lead our church, that you will give them wisdom and grace. We pray, Lord, for our health service at this time. We pray for Robin Swan, our health minister, and we ask, Lord, that you will be with all the health service workers at this time. Give them physical and emotional strength to those who are on the medical front line and especially to the nurses who must now take the place of loved ones, having to hold the hands of those who are in their dying moments. We also pray for staff in nursing and care and residential settings who have long-term caring relationships with their residents and are now having to adjust to new ways of working to protect them and also of a higher death rate. We bring before you now all those that are known to us with COVID-19 and at home and in hospital. We ask your peace for all those undergoing tests and treatment for other conditions. Protect them as they often have to travel further now to get the treatment and tests that they need. We also remember others we know who will have to wait much longer for planned operations and treat them and treatment. Help them to ver persevere. And we think Lord outside of our own land. We ask, Lord, for our missionary friends who are in situations where they don't have access to the same medical treatment as us. We thank you, Lord, that you are with them. We thank you, Lord, that you are with all those who are serving you, no matter what part of the world they're in. They are just as much in your care. And we pray, Father, that you will help them as they are surrounded by an overwhelming need, as the poverty and the hunger and the medical needs around them increase. We pray, Lord, that they will not feel overwhelmed and may know that you are with them. We ask all these prayers in and through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So thank you to Hannah and to Nikki. And uh, now uh, we're going to turn to uh, the Bible again, the passage that was read. In fact, uh, we're not going to start there. We're going to start where we left off last Sunday 
and last Sunday we came to the end of John chapter 20. Uh, those famous uh, verses at the end of John chapter 20, where John says that Jesus did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Now, as uh, I've been preaching through John's gospel for, I'm not sure how long it is now, a year and a half, two years perhaps off and on, uh, in the early days, uh, we spent quite a lot of time looking at those signs. And indeed, I pointed you to that verse, so those two verses in chapter 20, as to the purpose of the signs that you might believe and have life. Um, and so far, of course, we have up till now looked at um, seven signs. A lot of the scholars, biblical scholars, uh, say there are seven signs in John's gospel. We'll come next week to what I think is sign number eight. Uh, in chapter 21. Um, but for now, let's just take those seven um, signs that in a sense were public. Uh, the one in chapter 21 is more of a private thing for the disciples. But uh, the seven signs, uh, as you might remember, of course, were uh, in chapter two, the first one where Jesus turns the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. Uh, in chapter four, uh, he heals the royal official's son uh, who travels to Jesus, uh, asks Jesus to come, but Jesus stays where he is and heals the man's son at a distance. Uh, then in chapter five, there is the healing of the paralyzed man at the pool. Uh, the pool where lots of disabled, uh, sick people gathered. Uh, first one into the pool got healed. This man couldn't get into the pool because uh, of his um, disability. And so Jesus heals the man without using the pool. And then there are two signs in chapter six uh, that fit together as a pair, the feeding of the 5,000 and then Jesus walking on the water. And then uh, in chapter nine, there is the healing of uh, the blind man. Interestingly, the blind man is sent to a pool. Uh, in, the, in the second sign, Jesus didn't use the pool. Here in this one, um, he does uh, as the man has to exercise faith and go and wash and then he can see and then in chapter 11 <clears throat> perhaps the best known of uh, the signs when jesus uh, raises uh, lazarus from the dead you remember how uh, the message is sent to him that he's sick and jesus stays where he is and doesn't do what he did for the royal official and heal at a distance this time he has to wait and because he waits, Lazarus dies. And then when he comes, he performs this miraculous sign and calls Lazarus out from his tomb. So there are uh, the seven signs. And if um, those signs were meant to lead people to faith, um, how is it that having done so many signs, lots of people in Jesus' day didn't believe? That's the question I think I left you with last Sunday to think about. And I don't know if any of you have come up with a good answer to the question. Why was it that the majority of the people, and particularly the religious and uh, educated people, didn't believe in Jesus? Uh, how would you account for that? I remember in my student days giving people copies of John's Gospel. Um, for them to um, to read and sometimes uh, we would follow it up with a discussion. I do recall um, one chap who was tickled by the fact that I'd given him this book to convince him to believe in Jesus and one of the first uh, pages that he read was the story, the sign, this miracle where Jesus made gallons and gallons of wine and he was amused that, uh, that I, uh, um, a teetotaler, <clears throat> would give him such a book with such a story to try and convince him that uh, that Jesus was the Son of God. Um, nobody, uh, as far as I can recall, um, nobody ever asked me this question, though it would have been a pertinent question for them to have asked. Uh, if Jesus did all these signs, and more besides than the ones that John has uh, recounted for us in his gospel, 
Why did the multitude of his contemporaries not believe in spite of those signs? They weren't convinced. What would you say to that? How would you answer that question? Well, we're going to try and think about that a bit um, today. And to do it, uh, we're going to go back a little bit, uh, back to chapter 12, uh, the passage that Hannah read for us um, earlier. In chapter 12, we have essentially Jesus' final public words. Uh, you know, in chapter 13 on to 17, uh, we have Jesus teaching at great length to his disciples, and then he speaks a few things on the cross and so on. Um, but in essence, the final words of chapter 12 are Jesus' last words to the Jews and to his contemporaries. And though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. That's verse 36. Uh, again, it would help you to have your Bibles open at John, at John chapter 12 and, uh, and, and follow through and see this uh, analysis, if you like, of um, of the Jewish uh, leaders' unbelief. And here John, who's um, writing the gospel, is analyzing the reasons why. Uh, he'll give uh, an answer himself, and then he'll record uh, the words of our Lord Jesus himself. Uh, verse 37 um, onward, let me just read that again for you. Though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed uh, the message you've heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the, Lord, of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their hearts, and turn and he would heal them. Now, um, that might cause you to raise an eyebrow. Uh, you might think to yourself, well, what's happened to John? Has he suddenly turned into some kind of extreme Calvinist um, or something? Uh, well, uh, I don't think so. Um, it would help us to go back and to see the context in which Isaiah says those things that um, he has said. Of course, the first quotation comes from later in Isaiah chapter 53 uh, that leads on then to that wonderful moving uh, vivid image of Jesus um, crucified uh, which begins with the question who has believed this um, and uh, that's a, in a sense a, re a rhetorical question on uh, Isaiah's part um, but the the other um, quotation that John uh, uses comes from uh, chapter uh, 6 Isaiah 6 and verse 10 and uh, if we are to read that in its context in Isaiah, we will find that it's about what the theologians might call uh, God's judicial hardening because of Israel's persistence in unbelief and um, disobedience. Uh, that's why I told you the story uh, about um, the Indian with his arms stuck in the air for 10 years. Uh, when people, and perhaps particularly when the people of God, persist in unbelief and in disobedience, there comes a point when God says, okay, have it your own way then. And he hardens their hearts in the attitude that they themselves had first adopted. You see, when we deliberately reject the evidence that God has given, there are natural consequences. So if you say, uh, why do the majority of Christ's contemporaries not believe in him? Um, well, uh, John doesn't necessarily give us a full answer here. He's just hinting at it. Um, but if we take a slight diversion and go to uh, Matthew's Gospel, and in particular chapter 12, I'll read a few verses of it later, but you might uh, benefit from sitting down and, uh, and, and reading the whole of uh, that account in, in Matthew chapter 12, uh, where we have this discussion of it. Of course, that story takes place um, earlier in Christ's ministry, maybe halfway through his ministry. And our Lord uh, faces uh, them with this, um, this, this question. Um, uh, the Lord Jesus has deliberately healed a man on the Sabbath day um, because um, he is prompting and provoking this exchange and interchange with the scribes and Pharisees. 
Uh, they were not able to deny that he had done this supernatural act, uh, healing this paralyzed man um, on the Sabbath day. But their response was, uh, by Beelzebub, he casts out demons. Uh, by the devil himself, he casts out demons, Matthew 12, uh, 24. Now, that was so outrageous that you might have expected the Lord Jesus just to turn on his heels and walk away. Uh, he might well have said, you're talking absolute rubbish, gentlemen. It's not worth talking to you. And he might have walked off. But he didn't. He stood and he argued with them. He reasoned with them. And here we have shades of what Jesus will do at the final judgment. He shows them as they stood there in front of him that because they were determined to reject him as Messiah, they now had to say what they knew to be absolutely perverse and to call black, which in all other circumstances, that which they would have called white. What do I mean? Well, what he's saying is this. Um, you say, gentlemen, that I, by the power of Satan, am casting out demons. Is that so, really? Now, Satan, I suppose, has turned about destroying his own empire, has he, according to you? Is that your view of Satan? He destroys his own empire. He is empowering me to cast out his demons. Is that really what you're saying? Well, I mean, you know that if a, a question of some um, tyrant in his castle and uh, has all these prisoners and you want to uh, release his prisoners, how would you go about it? Well, of course, you'd have to first tie up the strong tyrant to get the prisoners out. So what are you saying that I am working with Satan? What to release his prisoners? Really? I mean, how absurd can you get? And then Jesus goes on and says, well, it occurs to me that some of your sons sometimes cast out demons, don't they? Would you mind telling me by what power they cast demons out? Do they cast them out by the power of Satan? Well, no, they, they, they wouldn't say that, of course. Um, but you see, um, you are saying that I do it, uh, but they don't. Well, there was one very good reason, of course, why they said it. You see, their sons, their disciples, their followers, those who cast out demons, did not claim to be the Messiah. Whereas Jesus did. And you see the logical implication of it. If he were casting out demons by the power of God, that was an indication that his claim to be the Messiah was true. And rather than admit the evidence that faced them, they were prepared to be as perverse as they were being. Listen to how Jesus puts it. Let me read a couple of verses. Matthew 12 verse 25 to 28. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So here are shades of the final judgment. They won't just be cast into hell, you know. It will be demonstrated to them that in rejecting Christ and with all the arguments they, that they came up with, they were being deliberately perverse, and they knew it. So this is the lesson of the prophets and the prophet 
prophet Isaiah uh, in particular that John quotes for us. It was also the lesson that was demonstrated to Pharaoh. Uh, it was Pharaoh who first hardened his own heart. Pharaoh had demanded evidence and when God gave him evidence and sign after sign, uh, Pharaoh refused to believe the evidence. And then at some point in the story, God steps in and says, okay, Pharaoh, you have it your own, your own way. And his heart is hardened. So here it is. Uh, John is speaking at the end of our Lord's ministry on earth and explaining why the Lord's com contemporaries as a whole didn't accept him. It's a serious thing, isn't it? There did come a point where God stepped in and said, okay, gentlemen, have it your own way. And that explains, maybe not in every aspect and fully, but substantially, why it was that there were so many in Jesus' day who refused the evidence of the signs. But um, <clears throat> look at John said look at what john says next uh, verse 42 nevertheless many even among the authorities believed in him uh, we need to uh, learn to uh, think and speak the way the hebrews did um when they said uh, none of them believed in him they were talking like um, hebrews do the, the majority didn't believe in him but and now he's going to qualify what he's saying uh, that even the rulers uh, let alone the ordinary people of them there were many who did believe and of course, for fear of the Pharisees, they didn't confess it uh, so that it would not be put out of the synagogue for they love the glory that comes from, from man more than the glory that comes from, from God. Verse 42. Uh, you might think of the case of Nicodemus. Um, and of course, he came uh, with Joseph of Arimathea, who likewise was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, Joseph had not consented to their uh, verdict to execute Jesus. You read that in Luke, Luke 23. Uh, but when, of course, when, when Christ had been crucified, then he plucked up courage and took his stand and went and asked Pilate for the body and he buried Christ. So there were those who did believe. There are always those who will believe. That's John's analysis of the reasons why many of his contemporaries, in spite of all these signs, they did not see the point of the signs, at least so they said, and they did not believe, but many did. And now here comes uh, Christ to say what he wants to say. Let me read verses uh, 44 uh, to the end of this uh, chapter. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The words that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a command. What to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me to. So this is our Lord's final comment. Rejecting him is not a personal question of revenge. He is saying, I have not come to judge the world. He's come to save us. But what I speak is what the Father has told me to speak. And I know that his commandment is life eternal. I speak the way of eternal life. Friends, what tremendous words these are from our Lord Jesus Christ. Just a few hours before his crucifixion. I speak into the world 
what the Father has given me to speak. And I know that his commandment is life eternal. That's why I speak it. It offers life. On the other hand, if you don't believe me, because the Father has sent me, that's the equivalent to not believing in God. It's no less than that. If you behold me, you're beholding God. He was God incarnate. If you don't believe me, you have one that judges you. Not so much I, but the word that I spoke. It will judge you. That word, if you disobey it and refuse to believe it, will be your judge in the final day. Of course, this is our Lord Jesus commenting. And it serves to balance what John has said. They didn't believe him because of the perversity of their thought throughout the Lord's ministry. And particularly that critical point that we looked at in uh, Matthew chapter 12. But some did believe, of course. And they did not come out into the, some of them didn't come out into the clear until uh, after Christ was dead. And indeed others, uh, not until after his resurrection. But some resolutely, knowing that they were perverse, deliberately rejected Christ. God stepped in and hardened their hearts. And from that point on, they could not believe. Of course, they didn't want to anyway. And that was that. It's a very serious thing. Not only knowingly rejecting Christ, but making accusations against him, as the Pharisees did, to say that he was of the devil. There's nothing more serious, friends, than rejecting Jesus. And that's what John emphasizes and his quotations from Isaiah vindicate that. Of course, it was useless for the Pharisees to say that we reject Jesus, but we still believe in God. Actually, they did not believe in God. Now, of course, we can easily illustrate that uh, if we think about Saul of Tarsus. Uh, Saul hated those Christians. Um, you know, he, he thought um, that uh, what they said was blasphemous. They were claiming that Jesus was uh, Christ, the Messiah. Um, dare say one line of thought he might have used was that, uh, of course, the Old Testament says that whoever is hanged on a tree is cursed of God. And that they're saying that this Jesus who was hung up on a tree was the Messiah. That sounded like blasphemy. And Saul of Tarsus thought that he knew everything about God, everything that was worth knowing. But of course, he didn't. And when he was struck down on the road to Damascus with a light that was brighter than the light of the sun, he didn't need to be told who was speaking to him. He responds, Lord, who are you? He knew enough to know that this was the Shekinah glory of God. And then the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Saul thought, thought that he, he knew God and knew all about God, but he didn't, did he? God was much bigger than anything that Saul of Tarsus had imagined. Therefore, when they heard Christ speak the very words of God that God had commanded him to speak, when they saw how Christ the very image of God behaved and they rejected that. Then they were rejecting God, says Christ. You can't reject Christ and suppose that you are okay with God. I wonder how many of you listening to me are a bit like some of those Pharisees. Now, I don't mean you're a horrible person. Uh, sometimes the image we get uh, as we talk about the Pharisees is that they were all terrible, horrible people. Um, some of them probably were, of course, uh, like any other group of people. But I mean, as, as, as a whole, they were religious people. Uh, they were sincere. In their own terms, they were searching out after God. 
But you see, they rejected the words of Jesus. They didn't see the signs. They didn't see what the signs meant and to whom the signs were pointing. To Jesus, the Son of God, who could raise the dead, who could forgive sins. These religious Pharisees had the what we might call I did it my way attitude. They were trying to please God in their own terms, observing their various religious rules and rituals. And then when God came and spoke to them through the Lord Jesus Christ, they would not listen. And friends, I worry that there are people who come to Carrick Fergus Methodist Church. Some of them even come really quite regularly who are good, decent, religious Methodist people. But they have not embraced the Lord Jesus Christ as the only saviour of sinners. Friends, there is plenty of evidence. If you're still a doubting Thomas, search it out. But there comes a point when you must decide. It's like that royal official back in chapter four, when he came and asked Jesus to come and heal his boy who was at the point of death. And Jesus says, um, you may go, your son will live. There came a point in that story where the royal official had faith. He took Jesus at his word and he went home. On the way home, he soon discovered the next day and the day after that, that the boy was healed and Christ could be trusted. I dare say, if he had refused what Christ had said at that point, his heart too would have been hardened and he never would have discovered the glorious truth that Christ forgives and sets free and makes us whole. And I hope that none of you will have hearts that are hardened like the people in Isaiah's day and in Jeremiah's day. And even those who walked alongside Jesus, actually listened to his spoken words, saw the miracles and signs that he did, but refused to believe in him. What good reason have you got not to put your trust in Jesus now? I'm gonna say a short prayer and it's a prayer that you can make your own when you can open your heart now in your home, wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening to this. And maybe for the first time, truly and earnestly repent of your sins and trust in Jesus. Here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you've come from the Father to speak all the words that he sent you to speak. I thank you that you've done the signs that point to the truth of the words that you speak. And I thank you that you've come to the hour when you were lifted up to die for my sins. Thank you that you love me enough to die for me. Thank you that your arms are open wide, ready to welcome me into faith and eternal life. Lord Jesus, I do trust in you. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you are the savior of the world. Lord Jesus, I do believe that you have saved me as I put my trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, uh, that's our service uh, for today and our thoughts from God's word. I do pray that you will read the passages in John uh, 12 
uh, in Matthew uh, 12 as well. And uh, if some things I've said have been a bit muddled and unclear, may God's Holy Spirit make them clear to you and do his continuing work in your heart. Uh, I might post again on Wednesday for the midweek. I'm not sure. We'll see. I'll, I'll, it'll be evident on the, on the, on the site if it's there. Uh, and then certainly next week, we'll be back again in John's Gospel and we'll come to uh, chapter 21 and to the final uh, of uh, what I think are eight signs in John's Gospel. Um, so you can um, read that and be um, prepared for that. So thank you for tuning in. And uh, let me just also say a final word of thanks um, on Lawrence's behalf uh, for uh, all of those who have responded in various ways to keep our finances ticking over uh, through this prolonged period of um, shutdown and who knows how much longer it will last. I do appreciate those uh, who have either arranged for envelopes to be picked up uh, or who have set uh, up um, standing orders or sent uh, Lawrence a check um, various ways that we can continue to uh, contribute um, to the ongoing um, financial needs of the church. Uh, so thank you for that and keep tuned in. God bless you all.